mics are missing a screw here that makes this adjustable. There's a bolt that's supposed to go right here. It's not there. It's not changing nothing.
You want the other table? Mm-mm. Nope. Just do my thing. Thank you very much. Any charge? All right, this thing is not keeping up on the charge. All right, let's get ready. All right, Chicago, what's up? This is your man, Maze Jackson. That's right, it's your man, Maze Jackson. Uh, this is episode five. That's right, episode five of Illinois Minati. Y'all ready to get it in? I'm telling y'all, I am excited. I'm excited. Um, uh, it seems like this thing is finally starting to crack. It seems like we're finally starting to get... Um, some action on the Illinois Minotti side. So let me just tell you what, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about all of this. But before we do, you know what, Sonia? Can I ask you to do me a favor? Can you plug, use your big square for this instead of that right there? All right, y'all. It's your man, Maze Jackson. Uh, let me start this thing off. I guess I got to do like I do every week, which is to introduce myself and say what's going on. Where's my printouts? I thought I had printouts over here. Uh, apparently I don't. Um, I think I got printouts for the rundown of the show. Yes, I am. Ex Thank you very much. I got my, huh? It is charging and you know what? We're going to have to buy straight Apple chargers. No more of this generic stuff. All right, y'all. This is Maze Jackson. This is episode, ooh, excuse me. Episode 5 of Illinois Minotti. Um, the, the title of this, as you can see, I used the, the, the acronyms up there, but the feds got the whole shit wired. Um, this podcast is going to really be a live example. I'm going to tell y'all what. I think that this podcast, ideally, if you were trying to figure out how does this become a, how does the Illinois Minotti go down? Um, I think it is in this episode where you will kind of see how all of this stuff ties together and how um, I would tell you that most people say that the speaker is impenetrable, right? They're saying that he's impenetrable. But I would tell you that um, what we see in this scenario right now is uh, I think they got a little sloppy. I think they got a little sloppy, and I think their sloppiness will get them into some trouble. But let's do this. I'm going to welcome everybody. I'm going to ask you all to take a moment, share the broadcast, share the broadcast. Go get your friends. Go get your family. Tell everybody, tune in. It is time for the next episode of Illinois Minati, y'all. We are about to make it happen. And I'm doing a little camera shots, playing around a little bit because I'm feeling a little technical. Oh, uh, yeah. Y'all ready? I don't think y'all ready. All right. If you're ready, let me know. Let me show me some love. Let me see some likes, some love, some hearts. Who's out there? You, you show me. Y'all, I need a little encouragement to get this ready. Now, I don't even understand how somebody would be calling me while I'm doing my podcast. I just don't understand that. I really don't. I really don't. I do the same thing every week, every week. Seven o'clock on Thursdays, and inevitably. 7 o'clock on Thursdays, somebody decides they're going to call right when I start the show. Well, do me a favor. Respect my game. Respect my game. All right. So, welcome to see episode two. No, excuse me. Season two, episode five of Illinois Minati, Inside Illinois' Political Secret Society. I am Maze Jackson, host of the WVON Morning Show with my co-host, Sonia Escobar, <laughs> who is actually producing the podcast tonight, and my co-host, Todd Stroger, who is probably somewhere asleep. So tomorrow when I get him on the show and I ask him, did he watch the podcast? He'll be like, you know, Maze, I no. That's what he's going to probably say tomorrow. All right, so but what I want you to do is tune in to us every every Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 a.m. Um, you know what I learned yesterday? Well, I can't tell you what I learned yesterday, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Then I want you to tune in every Thursday night right here from now through May 31st for the throughout the legislative session in Springfield so you can understand what's going on and how it affects us and our, our community from our perspective, okay? Plus, speaking of Springfield, shout out to State Representative Cam Cambium Buckner uh, for sponsoring the House Bill 4865, the What's In It for the Black People 
uh, Bill. We all went down to Springfield last week. Thank you to uh, Brother Kim for hosting us and letting uh, and showing us, uh, welcoming us in Springfield. Uh, yeah, we had some challenges, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, they tried to bury us. When they found out we were coming, they had to hurry up and pull the bill out of the Rules Committee. So I just want to tell y'all, man, we need to be, um, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm excited about that work that is happening. So you can take your computer because I got my own. But it looks like we've lost our broadcast for a second. Here. Um, if everybody's there, let me know. I just want to make sure we are all good and we are still rocking and rolling. Uh, look like I got a black screen right now. Uh, are you there? Is everybody still rocking with us? Come on back. You still good? You rocking and rolling? All right. So, yeah, this is... Uh, there we go. We're back. All right. Um, while we're at it, I want to take a few minutes to do a little housekeeping. Get that out of the way. Can you like the Maze Jackson page? That's right. I need you to like the Maze Jackson page. Um, and then I'm going to ask you not only to like the Maze Jackson page, I'm going to ask you to like the What's In It For The Black People page, right? And then I'm going to ask you to follow me on Twitter, right? And then after I ask you to follow me on Twitter, I'm going to ask you to go to Maze Jackson Said, uh, to the Maze Jackson Said on Instagram. And I'm going to ask you to follow me. What do you do on Instagram? Follow me, share me, like me. What do you do? What is that on Instagram? All right. Well, you know what? And you know what? I don't have a Snapchat yet. So when I get my Snapchat together, it'll probably be out of style. You know, if I get Snapchat, my kids are going to get off of Snapchat. So I just decided I would let that be. All right, y'all. Let's get this thing cracking, rocking and rolling. Um, it is time for episode five. Now, let me tell you. When we last left off, we were discussing uh, the damage that Danny could do. Is that where I left off last year, last week? Dan the damage that Danny could do. Uh, and with all of the people involved. Now, I want to make sure we're clear that some of the same characters that we saw uh, in the western suburbs have popped their heads up in this thing that is going on in City Hall. Particularly uh, those, and, and we'll hear a little bit more about them today, uh, but particularly the lobbyists. Remember we talked about the lobbyists? So today's story we're going to talk about, it's going to have the... The lobbyists aren't in it, but they're connected to it. So we'll talk about it. Uh, and we restarted uh, Illinois Minati. We restarted it after the indictment started happening in the western suburbs. Now, if you recall, when everything first started, and you would know this stuff if you listened to the WVON morning show. Um, when this first started, we, everything got cooking when we found out that 25th Ward Alderman, one of the most trusted and longest standing aldermen, Danny Solis, have been wearing a wire for almost two years. Two years. So you know how they, you know, my friends in the country got a statement that says, is a frog's ass watertight? Well, let me tell you what. When people found out that Danny Solis was wearing a wire for two years and he was one of the most trusted guys, he was the head of zoning, everybody got to wondering, oh my God, what did I say? Could I be on the tape? And uh, actually... There was a 120-page affidavit, and in that 120-page affidavit, most people didn't read it. They just took the summaries from the newspaper. But if you were to go through that affidavit and read it, they would tell a really sordid story, completely similar but completely different from what was going on in the western suburbs. Now I want to, I'm a, I'm a, so I took a lot of notes, but I think I'm a kind of do a little freestyle and a little notes too. So, so work with me, but I want you to think back to what do I tell you that company when, when these guys, so first of all, there's a racket. Can I say that this, let me, let me be clear. There's multiple kinds of, of lobbyists. And let me also full disclaimer, everything that we are talking about today, none of it am I claiming it to be fact. I'm not claiming it to be fact. I am alleging it. I am giving you it as an analysis from a person who at one time sat in the same room with a lot of these same people. So I am giving you my estimation. I do not want this to be considered fact. I just want you to remember what I told you so when it unrolls, I could tell you I told you so. I think I'm going to have a I told you so segment. 
on the WVO and Morning Show while you bullshitting, right? Where it's be like, uh, Sonya, say that because I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. So I want you to listen to this because I'm going to tell you some things that will come to true, true, to fruition in a while. But the first thing, remember when I told you when they have decided they are going to take advantage of a company, remember what I told you they look for? They look for a controversial company, right? A controversial company with a challenge, with an issue that what do they do? They want to have a controversial issue so that they can get one of their people inside of your company to do what? To look around your company, assess the value, and see how much they actually can get out of you, right? Now, we've seen that pattern. We saw it in the western suburbs, right? We saw it with Pat Doherty. We saw it with uh, the the uh, lawyer. We saw it with the lobbyists. So I want you to keep that as a frame of reference. The reason I say this is because there's good lobbyists and there's bad lobbyists. Good lobbyists, oh, and remember I told you about the Fetcher bill, right? And how they create a scenario, etc. Well, in this case, we're going to see a little bit different. There wasn't a Fetcher bill, but there was a controversial company with what? A challenge. And with that challenge, they then got a lobbyist slash consultant who turned out to be, in this case, Alderman Danny Solis, who got into the company. And what did he do? As soon as he got in the company, he looked around and he said, how can I rape, rob, pillage, and plunder this company? Now, I say that in extreme because I don't think it's that. They don't say, how do we rape, rob, and pillage it? But what they do do is do a value assessment. And they try to identify how much money is this company worth. Is there going to be real money here? Is this a big thing? Is this a little thing? Is it a one-time hit, etc.? Now, let me just be clear. You do not go see the speaker if you're a little fish. You don't. You don't. He's not going to take a chance bringing you in the office. But that's something that will go back. So let me go back because I, I jumped around a little bit. And y'all know I got ADD. So don't get upset with me. If you And I wanna, I'm going to try and end 15 minutes early today so that you can have an opportunity to ask questions. So write your questions down. Uh, and then we will try. I will try and get Sonia to grab and snag questions. And we will try to answer them in the last 15 minutes. But I broke down to you in the last... Uh, segment how Danny could how Danny what do I call it how Danny could uh, how much damage Danny could do it started with I broke down to you that Danny was caught accepting pills sex and perks in exchange for zoning favorability right I told you about the connection remember the connection between the lobbyist and the chairman of the Latino caucus the chairman of the Latino caucuses and by being the chairman of the Latino caucuses, the lobbyist then buttressed them with money to be able to have the tacit understanding that he was in control of the Latino caucus, right? Because if I got the, does that make sense? So if I got, the, if I've given the chairman of the Latino caucus, every chairman of the Latino caucus, he committed to raising $100,000 from them. But guess where he's getting those hundred thousands of dollars from? From the companies that want to do business with the with the city and the Latino caucus. So if I own the chairman of the Latino caucus, which is the strategy that the lobbyist employed, let me own the perceived leader of the Latinos. And if I own the perceived leader of the Latinos, then guess what? Anybody that wants to do business knows that I got these Latinos and the Latino caucus chairman behind me. Well, when you see that, and who is who have I told you is the rising group in the city of Chicago? The Latinos. If you recall, the very first fundraiser that Mayor Emanuel had when they announced the $1.6 billion uh, O'Hare expansion, even though there was a black person in, over the committee, the first place he had his first fundraiser was at the Latino caucus. Now, what that meant was, so everybody who wanted to do any business with the airport was then given an invitation immediately following saying, come to this fundraiser where Mayor, Mayor Emanuel will be here as we discuss 
the new airport expansion. Now, what that did was that sent a signal to all of the people doing business that if you wanted to do business at the airport, the Latinos were in control, right? Because that's the first place the mayor went. Now, these are all things that you're not going to know as a regular person. First of all, you're not going to even get an invite to it. But second of all, what those what that fundraiser did, and then essentially what the lobbyists did, was put the fundraiser, have the fundraiser in the name of all of those Latino caucus chairmen that he owned, or con said that he owned, have the fundraisers in those names, and then when they came in, they see that if you want to talk to him, you got to go through me. And so essentially the way that the lobbyists worked was his goal was to buy, and when I talk about the lobbyists, I'm talking about Victor Reyes. The way he operated was I'm going to control this, the Latino community from the top. I'm going to have all, I'm going to be the biggest fundraiser, I'm going to have the biggest political army, and I am going to make every Latino caucus chairman mine. Because again, sort of like us, the Latinos didn't have a big fundraise. well let me back up, they did have a big fundraising, uh, a big fundraising way that they did it, but we'll talk about that in a whole nother episode. So now, I told you about the connection between the lobbyists and the chairman of the Latino caucus. And I told you, you cannot forget this because this is another I told you so moment. I want you to take a moment and put a pin in this. Remember how I told you about how state, how Danny Solis and his sister, Patty Doyle Solis, who was the right hand woman to Hillary Clinton, started a company where they made money off of people who were waiting for their checks to come from the state. And remember how I told you they were teamed up with, they gave over a hundred and something thousand dollars to the then comptroller, Susanna Mendoza. Now, why is that important? Because Susanna Mendoza is in charge of cutting the checks to the companies that are doing business with the state. So if I hold your check up, right? and you are in desperate need of your money, and I say, well, it's gonna be another two months, you go to the comptroller, right? The comptroller says, I'm sorry, we're not gonna have your money right now, but what you can do is go over there and talk to Danny Solis and Patty Solis, and they can get you a loan for only 1% interest. But if you are got a million dollar contract and you're trying to get your 1%, so basically what I am alleging is that there was a racket going on. There are multiple rackets going on in the Latino community. But the comptroller, Susanna Mendoza, mark my words, put a pin in this, because she took over a hundred and something thousand dollars from... Danny Solis's company when she was in charge of cutting the checks to the vendors. But she want to get up and be on TV and stand up. And, like, I, I, I can't believe Joe Biden even accepted her endorsement, right? Like, think about that. Like, who wants an endorsement of somebody that you, you presume has been part of this racket with Danny Solis? And you know she ain't been talking that much about it because... You know, like when you, you know, you can talk smack when it's somebody that don't got no dirt on you. That's why she went and attacked Safe Speed, right? Because it's easy to attack Safe Speed, but you're not going to attack the guy that was the federally and the, the guy that was wearing the wire that you took a hundred and something thousand dollars from. So what you, what now what I'm telling you is happening with people like Mendoza and all of these people is they're trying to distance themselves from all of these people. But I believe in my mind, it's too late. The feds have already figured out the racket, right? The feds have already figured out the racket, uh, and it's all coming apart. So that's all kind of where I left you off, right? So now I'm gonna be I'm gonna be straight up. And then oh, and in the last episode, I alluded to the fact that former Alderman Solis could have been caught up by his good friend Roberto Caldero. Now, if you recall in the indictment, Roberto Caldero was the guy who was hooking him up. 
with the sex pills, taking them to the Chinese massage parlors. I did to, and then uh, work, but he was also a consultant for another company and he was doing the sex pills and all that stuff to get favorable allowances for the company that he represented, right? Because now what I want you to understand is, because here's the thing, everybody looked at the way that the speaker has done his thing and tried to create their own mini version of it, right? So the speaker, has a business, he uses that business to get work, or no, he uses that business to get rich and people know that because he is, in, he is the speaker of the house, people are going to do whatever he asks. I'll talk to you a little bit about that because he kind of alludes to that in a different way. But what we didn't discuss in that whole premise was the potential that the Solis wiretaps have to take down the green team in the city and the state. So, it's right here where we will pick up and get started. So let's start with the fact that the Solis tapes have already led to a 50 count indictment for Alderman Ed Burke and Pete Andrews. Now, Pete Andrews, you, you know, Pete Andrews is somebody you only know if you're a political insider. Pete Andrews was the right-hand man of Ed Burke. He was, you know, like in the Game of Thrones, the hand of the king? He was the hand of the king. If, 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 if Pete Andrews came to see you, you had problems. Or, or he was a messenger for Ed Burke. But I, I, I'm going to say we've also discussed uh, Mike McClain. And how he ran the family for Madigan. We also learned that for all the fear and intimidation tactics that they used. Can I just say something? And I, I really got to bring this down. The more I read this stuff, the more I am convinced that they were not so smart. As much as they had enough power to bully and will their way through. Right? Like people talk about, oh my God. The speaker and their, their team is so smart and they would never be. And I think we've got this. He's cultivated this mystique. And his team has cultivated this mystique. And they've enforced it with fear and intimidation through contracts, through cutting you off, etc. But as the more I read these indictments, they are sloppy. They were sloppy. They were sloppy and a little bit drunk with power. They had a little bit of hubris. And I think that as we look at this and as I break this down to you, you'll get a different sense and you'll maybe see for all of the stuff that we've been talking about, how all of this ties together as to what I'm saying. So, but I got to say this, right? I'm sure that in Springfield right now, there are people saying, what the fuck was Mike McClain thinking, right? He put all of this shit in writing. He put all of these, these notes and these memos in writing. So I, I, I want to be clear that I'm starting to move away from the fact that they were the smartest political operation ever and that he's the genius. And, you know, like when Susanna Mendoza did the speech and the world would not be here if it wasn't for a speaker, Mike no, man, I think when you got enough power and you got enough G with it, you ain't got to be smart. You just push through. All right. But, I mean, think about this. Y'all, I mean, just for all the spring people that pe Springfield people that are watching who are some lurking, I'm just saying. I mean, for real, he put that shit in writing. In writing. Okay. Also, did y'all see in the emails they released last week? I was in the emails. Did you see that they had in the emails that they tried, that McLean? Uh, tried to get the most powerful, the two most powerful, two of the most powerful black men in the city to come against me. And did you hear that they said it wasn't working? Did you read that part when they said it wasn't working? And then he turned around and told the speaker, uh, could you give us a list of what we've done for the African Americans? Hey, y'all, we can stand up. We can fight. We can survive, right? And we don't got to do it with Bernie Sanders. Shade. All right. Uh, and with the Mike McClain thing, I'm still wondering when they're going to tell him to get in the bathtub. Y'all seen the Godfather? You seen the Godfather the scene? So like when you fuck over the family the way you fuck over the family. Remember he was like, you know, in the great Roman days, you would get in the bathtub. The general knew his family would be taken care of. And he would sit in a hot tub. And he would slit his wrists. Hey, bro. Mike McClain, you taking the family down, bro. 
<laughs> taking the family down. Oh, I'm right. I'm gonna stop because you know they still they still running around here lurking. But I'm just tell y'all something. Can I tell y'all one more thing? I'm tired of black people being scared. And can I tell you something one more thing? The other thing I just gotta say is that, and I had a crazy conversation today, and this is an aside. We don't have to be scared if we don't have to worry about each other stabbing us in the back. They are scared. White folks are scared of black folks if y'all work together. But I'm going to let that go. Like, the reason that y'all, they have cultivated the hate for Maze is because, guess what? They threw the sink, bro. They threw the sink. I'm moving on. So we've heard the stories about, now, I, I got to go on. We've heard the stories about Ed Burke asking for the tuna and whether, asking for the tuna, right? Remember, is the tuna landed? And then remember when he asked, uh, you know, when he was saying, has the cash register rung yet? Everybody was like, I can't believe he said that. That's crazy, right? Then we heard Sandoval ask about a baloney company, right? Remember when he was like, man, I just want the money. Uh, you got a baloney company? We got to figure out a way to get this money to me a different way. But what I never told you, and what, but one of the things we've never seen or heard is anything untoward or potentially incriminating come out of the mouth of the Speaker of the House. And unless you, uh, and quite frankly, you've never heard anybody suggesting that the speaker has ever broken the law. Why hasn't he, is, have you heard he hasn't broken the law? Because he writes the laws. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up my level. But he writes the laws. So we don't ever think of him ever violating the law. Quite frankly, you really don't have a lot. Remember, there's the whole thing, he doesn't use cell phones. I mean, he has cultivated this whole mystique. But I was thinking when I read that 120 page affidavit, some words, two statements jumped off of the page for me. And I told everyone that I could that every person, so if you read that 120 page indictment was broken into sections and every one of those sections told a different story connected to Danny Solis. And what I told my friends was, what I told my friends was, if you look at this indictment, every single person in that, uh, every single person in that indictment or that affidavit was either a subject of the investigation or they were a cooperating witness. Now, again, this is all I'm alleg I'm alleging all of this. This is all based on my this is all based on my knowledge of the situation, not my knowledge of the situation, but how things work in Springfield. So now I'm looking at this and I take the I take the 220 page indictment and I break it down into sections. And after I broke it down into sections, that's how I came with the map. No, you can't call in. Damn. There's, no phone <laughs> There's not a phone number. Yet. And are you really texting me while I'm on the show? Like, are you calling me while I'm on the show? Okay. Now, let me also go on to what, I, but let me just say this. Because as I was doing this thing, I, what I got wrong in this was who was the original how did this whole thing start like how did they get caldero how did you, did you get um how did they get the connection to danny solis and how did they catch because remember Roberto, my estimation was roberto caldero cordero was the reason that Danny Solis got caught up. But then, I don't know if you all saw this week, but there was a Chinese developer named C. Wong who was not only wearing a wire, but video evidence. 
And if you read the affidavit, there were two, two, two statements that jumped off the page that in my estimation, if the feds ever decide they're going to put a RICO case together, tie this whole thing together. Here's the phrases. Stand alone. And I got to be clear. That if you read these, because I, you know, I, I'm going to check, shout out to all the people in Capital Facts. But if you read the comments in Capital Facts, I would tell you that the people who are in Springfield are all, the speaker has a, a, a mystique an aura. He is the king of Springfield. Like literally people won't look him in the eyes. Literally. Like people go to the restaurant and hope that he will give them a nod. And so when you talk to people in Springfield, they talk from a perspective that nothing could ever happen, that he's so smart and so impenetrable that, and if you even speak on it, he'll cut you off. But I was reading that affidavit and there were two phrases that jumped off for me. The first one was, we're not interested in a quick killing here. We're interested in a long-term relationship. What do I tell you about the companies and what they say? When they get in, the goal is to get into the company and bleed it and stretch it out for a long time. So when you hear the Speaker of the House say, we're not interested in a quick killing here. We're interested in a long-term relationship. It's the fancy word. It's the nice conge. And actually, the first half of the sentence, we're not interested in a quick killing here, i.e. they're hunting. They're hunting business. They're hunting. And who is... And now let, let me ask you a question. Think about if your name is C. Wong. Right? Remember I told you Ed Burke went after the the Indian hedge fund? Because you know why they go after they go after people who are least likely to tell. Right? So if you're a foreigner, you you used to coming from a country where if you tell the government, the government gonna chop you up, right? So you ain't go a Chinese person when you go to bleed them, they used to getting shook. So it was the same way with Ed Burke and the Indian guy, but I'm, I'm going to let that go. So now here's what you got. You got the Speaker of the House with Danny Solis. Now, Danny Solis is wearing a wire, but Danny Solis goes in and brings this man to the Speaker and says, because remember, the man hires Danny Solis to get help, right? Danny says, let me take you to the Speaker. Why do you go to the Speaker? Because if you go to the speaker, then you know whatever you want. If you pay the speaker, can I ask, can I, can I help you understand this? If you, if the phone rings and it's, hello, my name is Michael Madigan, Michael J. Madigan. I'm calling from Madigan and Getz and Danner. You're going to say, yeah, but you're the speaker. You don't care nothing about no Madigan and Getz and Danner, Right? So at that point, and remember, the speaker also has Joe Berrios, who is who? The chairman of property. Let, let me back up because that, that's a whole nother story. I'll leave that there. So now the other thing the speaker says is we have a different way we uh, do business. Basically saying that if you hire me, things change. If you hire me, things change. So Springfield insiders would look at those two statements and say, oh, you got nothing. But when you tie it all together, when you tie the fact that, and did I explain what happened? So basically, uh, you know what? So here's what happened. This Chinese developer wants to build a project and runs out of money. So he needs a tax break. So he goes to Alderman Solis. Alderman Solis says, I got a fish. I got a fish and I could take this fish to the speaker. And if I take this fish to the speaker and I get the speaker to, I will be, I will get credit because I brought the speaker a new client, right? And by giving the speaker a new client, the speaker will look favorably upon me 
for this guy, but in other endeavors. Now, y'all, so, but here's the problem. The problem is everybody's wearing a wire. So now you got Danny Solis, who's wearing a wire, who's trusted by the speaker to some extent. And you've got C. Wong wearing a wire and video capturing it all. And so now I brought this guy with a problem to the speaker. The speaker says, so really the way it works is, this guy, this is how it goes. Before, speaker, I'm calling you, I'm bringing a client to you. The speaker's gonna be like, now he ain't gonna say it this way, but he's gonna be like, man, is this, is this worth my time? Is it worth my money? It's Mr. Speaker, I'm telling you. This guy's got a ton of money. You're going to want to have him. You bring him. So the speaker, because you know the speaker ain't just meeting with no Rudy Poots, right? He just not. Because he can, I mean, this guy represents biggest buildings in the state. So if you're just some peon, he's not going to just take you, right? So now the speaker, so Danny Solis, but now Danny Solis is working with the feds. I don't know if he knows the other guys working with the feds, but they both are now targeting the speaker trying to get him to say something. Now, again, I would tell you that that stands up when he says the, uh, we're not looking for a quick strike. That was the conversation that him and Danny Solis said. So he didn't say, I want a big lump sum of money, right? We want the big lump sum of money. They'd be like, I just want to bleed you out. I just want a monthly payment for the next 10 years right now so now you got the speaker in the room with these two guys both federal agents who he trusts one of them and he thinks the other guy vetted the other guy both of them are wearing wires and the speaker says hey we don't want to bleed you out so now we know what's going on and then when they say uh, we've got a different uh way we do business what is that different way what is that different methodology that you use to do business? Now, I'm going to tell you that even as you read this story even further, the speaker went out of his way to pass laws and use other legislators. He went as far as to go to the legislator and to make the, to make this money. He went to a the Chinatown legislator and said, "Hey, one of your constituents needs help. Can you do this for me? I need you to acquire this land in a bill." The legislator says, no way, uh-uh, I'm not doing it, I'm not getting in trouble. So let me tell you what the speaker does. He goes and gets a Republican from downstate to make the land transfer. For the guy who is, this guy that's down, so basically there's a piece of valuable land that they want to get. But no one has been able to get it for years and years and years and years. Danny Solis takes him to the speaker and says, if you hire the speaker, you can get this land. So now the speaker who has this guy as a tax client is taking legislative action using other people to get him what he wants. So now, no, 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 no. It's not legal. It's not legal. It's legal for him to represent the guy for taxes. It is not legal for him to tell represent state representative Avery Bourne that after I talked to the legislator for the area who said she wasn't willing to do it, I'm going to make this land available that has been unavailable for people for years because now this guy just hired me. And then I'm going to pass a law. I'm going to use my position as the Speaker of the House to tell a Springfield Republican from downstate that I want you to acquire a piece of land in a bill that no one is going to know what happened, but we're going to just slide it in there and make it happen. Y'all, I'm going to tell you that those two phrases, we're not interested in a quick killing, and we have a different way of doing a business is the is in my estimation we now my friends have a smoking gun because again when the feds speak as to the speaker what did you mean by you didn't want a quick kill what exactly did you mean by that uh and he said oh you know i just i just didn't want to just take a big lump sum of money i got that so what is uh the different way of doing business that you have because we talked to this legislator representative uh from the chinatown 
She said she didn't want to have any parts of it. But what you did was you went down Springfield and you had this change. Now, uh, is that the different way that you do business? Do people get a, a competitive advantage? What a competitive advantage working with you? Because now you're the speaker of the house, and even if it's illegal and the people locally don't want it, you can pass a law to make it happen. See y'all, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell y'all. What you are now starting to see is the unraveling. You're starting to see the unraveling. What you are seeing is hubris, right? Hubris. When when the brother feel like he's so powerful, you know what? I'm gonna just take it. I'm gonna just take. They won't do it legally. They won't. Do, they won't do it. Well, guess what? I'm the speaker of the house. I'll pass a law to make it legal. So that's how legislators operate. Like, if they don't like what you want to do, what they will do is pass a law to screw you. So now, here's what we got. Because y'all, I'm running out of time. So let's get ready to be time for question and answers. So here's what we got. Huh? No questions? Y'all got any questions? Let me know if y'all got any questions. So now here's what we got. We got Danny Solis wearing a wire. But also understanding the process that if I take someone to the speaker, the speaker and get them a client, the speaker will use all of the powers that he has. I'll take him to the law office of Madigan and Getzendanner. He'll walk through that front door. And the moment that you walk through the front door of Madigan and Getzendanner and you hire Madigan, you now have hired the speaker of the house. Think about it. If you are my client and the speaker calls you and says, hey, I'm looking for you to help my guy, there's nobody that's going to not do it. So understand, now, now, what you got, now what he would tell you is there's nothing illegal about that. There, and I would tell you that if he didn't pass a law, if he didn't use his undue influence, but I'm going to tell you one more time, we're not interested in a quick kill. That's the only thing we heard off of that tape. We don't know what else we've heard. We don't know what else is on that tape. But if you got that and you combine that, so now take, we're not interested in the quick killing here. We're interested in the long-term relationship. Then you take what you've seen them do to ComEd. When they took millions of dollars and spread that around. When you think about what you saw them do to safe speed what you see them doing to all of the companies with challenges you start to understand the racket the racket is very simply this and it is what we call in the business scalable scalable so what everybody learned and i'm going to tell you what people learned it the way illinois politics used to be was everybody had a legislative job. The reason those jobs were part-time was so that they could get you a side job that paid you, that allowed him to keep you in control. Keep, keep, because you only make $70,000 a year. So I give you a side gig to help you get to 120, and now you got to do whatever I say. But now, here's what we got, guys, because I want to make sure you all are clear. We got, in this I want you to take this model. First of all, I broke down to you that first of all, they look for companies that are in trouble, controversial, and have a need, right? The Chinese developer, controversial, needed land, right? Um, what was the last one? Controversial and they need. And then they then put Danny Solis in the company. Danny Solis then followed the same pattern, got hired as a consultant for this person goes into his assesses what he's got and says man if i take this guy because he's got enough money i take him to the speaker then i can have points with the speaker and the speaker can help me with mine the guy says i'm gonna hire the speaker because if i hire the speaker i know i'll get what i want to get done but the fact of the matter is the speaker has a business that he uses his legislative power to fund. It's no different than, so again, if I'm the speaker of the house and I got a law firm and you trying to get something done and you got the money, who you hire? The speaker of the house. Because guess what? Everybody in the whole state reports to him. So essentially what you find is that, but the, the speaker has been in the game for a long time. 
right? And so he's mastered it. I mean, they know the ins and outs. They write the loopholes to walk through. For the other guys who have tried to replicate that, they didn't. Ha they try to do the same thing, create a new company, something, but they can't let, they don't pass the laws and they're sloppy, so they don't write the loopholes. So what they think is they're smarter than everybody, so they start a whole nother company, and I'm going to have a translation company. I'm going to have a bologna slicing company. I'm going to have, Ed Burke had the same kind of company, a property tax appeals company. But here's the thing. See, they knew how to do it because they wrote the laws to protect themselves. Everybody else got a little sloppy. But then towards the end, they start getting a little sloppy. They start getting a little big dicky. They start feeling like, you know I am the man. And what essentially happens is they've gotten so smart and believe their own press releases that they start to get a little loose with the lips. And they get a little loose with the lips. And now all of a sudden the feds are on you. You know, I'm going to tell you all. This case. And I'm going to tell you that there's multiple cases. This has the potential, in my estimation, to strip Illinois govern government. I don't know what's behind this. I don't know who's behind this. Um, but what I believe is happening right now is that a 40-year-old ironclad grip on the city and the state is being broken. The question now is, what will the black people do? Right now, the new table is being set. It is being set right now. White folks are planning for a future. Black folks are still trying to prove their loyalty to the past. What I want for you all as part of Illinois Minati to understand is there is a real game going on right now and you are right now witnessing the decapitation of a 40 year empire and along the de and every great empire falls every great empire falls and it usually falls because the people have gotten so they've expanded beyond their limits or they get too arrogant as we've seen in the emails from Mike McLean and the speaker and all of these guys. Now, I'm gonna, when we come back next week, I'm going to help you see, I'm gonna break, the, I'm gonna go back into that indictment. And I'm gonna say that I think this indictment reveals another, I think we have more evidence in this, in, in this affidavit that the lobbyists that we talked about are also informing. At this point, I think that everyone is informing. And I think at this point, people are now trying to save their own asses and their own skins. Now, one of the craziest things that I think is so odd, and I was talking about this a little bit earlier today, is that at the center of all these stories, the connector to all these stories is the lobbyist. He connect, Victor connects all these people. And I just want to explain one more thing real quick. Um, because they, I, and, and, and you know, man, you know, maybe I'll say that for next week. Because I think I might need to break down the Latino power structure next week. So you can understand who the players were in that era um, during that time. How they kind of rose to power. And then how they were able to keep power. The reality is they were able to keep power because they did very similar to what Mayor Daley did. Uh, when Victor got bounced from the city, he made a relationship in Springfield with the speaker. Now the question becomes, again, if we saw what happened to Robert Sorich, oh you guys don't know about that, but if we know that all the people that he originally was with, if your whole crew gets indicted and you don't, Right? 
then people got to ask questions. Then everybody, but the, the, the curious, the most curious part of this was everybody knew that, including the speaker, and they let him back in the doors. So now my question is, who is an informant? Hey, y'all, I'm going to tell y'all what. This has been the fifth episode of Illinois Manati. Now, I got three minutes. I could take a couple minutes. I'll take a couple questions if you got them, if there's anything you want to know. Now, I'm going to tell y'all. You know I tell y'all too much, right? You know I be telling y'all too much. But I'm going to also tell y'all that it is time for us to stand up and step up. Right? All right. I'm going to look through. Let me see who's out here. Let me say what's up. Uh, Shout out to Brother Patah. Shout out to Tiger Lily. Y'all are faithful listeners. Shout out to Laverne Smith. Is that Laverne Bell Smith? Did I get that right? Uh, what up, BMO? What up, Tammy Jackson? What up, Brother Patai? What up, Tony Balderrama? What up, Sharon, uh, Shannon Young? What up, Alvin E. Norton? What's up to Diane Scott? Uh, what's up to uh, Janet Epps? What's up to t uh, Rodney Ware? What up to Anita Moore? What up to Laverne Smith Bell? What up to Kyle Edwards? Shout out to Bolenbrook in the Hill in the building. What up to Milton Ingram, Quincy Frierson, James Big Slim Davis? Uh, what up to India Moore? What up Marvin Bell? What up Beverly Jackson? What up Edna? What up to uh, Ty Strober? Ty didn't come. You know Ty be playing us bogus. All right, y'all. This is Illinois Minotti. This has been the fifth episode of Illinois Minotti, Inside Illinois Poli Secret Political Society. Now, let me ask y'all a question. Do y'all get anything out of these podcasts? Go back and listen. Is it worth it? If, if, if you, you probably need to go back and listen. Check us out on SoundCloud. And starting next week, we'll be on iTunes and we'll be on Spotify. So I want you to start taking this this podcast, sharing it. Some of you all watch it, but some of you all can listen to it in the car. All right? Anybody got any questions? All hard clear. Hey, y'all, uh, I want to say a bit, send a big shout out to Sonia Escobar. She is producing the joint today. Big swill, late than a motherfucker. Um, but I'm going to tell y'all what. One monkey don't stop the show. Hey, this is the Illinois Minotti Podcast. So check this out. Check this out. I need to catch y'all Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 on the WVOM morning show where you can catch myself, you can catch Sonia Escobar, and we don't know Ty be getting that late. Um, I want to encourage you all to pick up your What's In It for the Black People Voters Guides. Those are available. Can somebody hand me one? Is there one over there somewhere? Or is some in that box right behind you that I'd like to show the people? We got them. We got them. Hustle up. Hustle up. Hustle up. Come on. The What's In It for the Black People Voters Guide. I need you all to pick that up. Get out, vote. Please make sure you vote for our can our candidates. Um, I don't know what's going on with this coronavirus stuff, but I know this. It don't be interrupting my broadcast. Um, uh, shout out to the judges. Look, I'm looking for you all. Check out my girl, Kim Fox. I need you to support Kimberly Neely, Dubu Clay, Richard Boyk, and we can teach the party a lesson. And P. Scott Neville. Also, don't forget to vote for the judges. Shout out to Felicia Simmons Stovall. She is running in the uh, second sub circuit. Please vote for her and my man, Tom Condon, who is running in the third sub circuit. All right, y'all. That's it for tonight. I'm going to head, get me some food, get to bed. And I'll see y'all tomorrow. We'll be ready tomorrow by 2. And, oh, and the podcast will be up and available tomorrow by 2 p.m. 2.30 p.m. Courtesy of Miss Sonia Escobar. Now, for everybody here in the Illinois Minotti Podcast, I am the host, Maze Jackson. And every day, if you listen to me Monday through Friday, 6 to 9, you can catch me asking the question, what's in it for the black people? And if you don't like it, you can still, as always, tell them. Maze said, we out of here. Peace.